Hello and welcome to this episode of the ASHA podcast. I'm Fred Wyant with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA. People use apps to find someone to date or hook up with. I mean, there's nothing new there. But what about using apps to notify someone when they might need to think about STI testing and prevention services, of course, sexually transmitted infections? It's happening, permission-based, of course. And we're exploring this today with Morgan Finke, the Communications Coordinator with Public Health, Madison and Dane County in Wisconsin, go Badgers. And we wanna to talk to Morgan because her health department is utilizing dating apps for some partner notifications. So Morgan, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So if you would walk us through the process when somebody at one of your clinics is diagnosed with an STI. First, what does staff tell a client about these app-based notifications? Right. So after getting someone through their diagnosis and their own health and, and kind of helping them understand what's happening with their health um, and the next steps for treating that, um, public health staff, our staff will help clients understand um, kind of the importance of reaching out to recent partners that maybe have been exposed to an STI um, just so that they can get that same testing and treatment if, if necessary. Um, so Public health staff, you know, here in Dane County and throughout the country have long um, helped with that notification process or offered our services to help with that notification process. Um, it's just that we are recently utilizing, um, as you mentioned, dating apps as part of that notification process in case they may only have um, the information about where they met and their, you know, username of the app that they met on versus their full name, their phone number, you know, contact information. So this um, additional utilization of dating apps is just an attempt to reach more people um, that we may not have been able to reach before. So it's just kind of expanding the existing um, partner notification process that we had here in Dane County. And again, just in attempts to meet people where they are and meet, you know, the dating landscape is changing. So um, we're just kind of trying to adapt with that. I like what you said, meeting people where they are. That's a theme that I've been hearing over and over in public health conversations about we just can't be sit static and sit back and let people come to us. You know, we need to actually go out and find them and provide them with services where they are. So that that makes perfect sense. Um, I just want to ask you quickly about the staff, like how they're trained to interact with patients about dating app notifications. Are pro there are people are probably worried about privacy or, or, or something like that. How, do, how are the staff prepared to, to really interact with these people in this way? Right. So um, our trained staff work with clients and, of course, privacy when it comes in the health space is incredibly important. Privacy and confidential confidentiality are top priorities for our staff. So um, part of the training process is just kind of figuring out how exactly we're gonna reach the, those folks on the dating apps. Um, the messages are always sent anonymously without sharing who may have exposed them. Um, so clients can feel more comfortable sharing that partner information. Um, and then again, just this is kind of touching on process, but again, it's part of the training. Um, on apps with the search feature, the staff will look for the username um, that the, our client provided and confirm if it's the correct person before reaching out. And the part that we wanna make really clear is that the main goal of this is just to locate partners as quickly as possible. The messaging on the apps is actually limited to arranging a phone call so that we can discuss further. So specific health information, whether it be you know speaking about their potential um, of being exposed or you know potential health information will never be shared in messaging on the app. That is always um, just directing to a phone call so that we can speak with them over the phone about any potential exposure. So um, again, just trying to maintain that privacy as much as possible um, and just give them the education that they need to potentially take those next steps for themselves. And you anticipated my next question. I was going to ask, when somebody gets a notification, what is it? It's not, hey, you might have an STD, right? So it sounds like they're very discreet and respectful and not not terribly alarmist, which, which I would expect. 
Right. So public health staff would never tell someone through the app that they might have, you know, an SDI. Um, the messaging, again, is just limited to let's arrange a phone call so that we can talk about this further. Um, again, we always want to protect the confidentiality of the person who is diagnosed as well. So, you know, we want to limit that back and forth exchange of messaging on the app itself keep that pretty much limited to just arranging for a phone call where we can share more information. Um, but yeah, that the, the messaging itself on the app is pretty limited. Okay. Um, I wanna ask you about the scope of STIs in your county. So you're in Dane County, and of course that includes Madison, the state capital, right? Um, how big of an issue are STIs for, for, for you in public health there? Yeah, so STIs are very common. Uh, in Dane County, we see hundreds of people every month diagnosed with an STI. Um, in terms of trends, it's mostly chlamydia and gonorrhea that we're seeing. Um, and while Dane County's overall STI rate has actually decreased over the past five years, um, there are some areas that we see higher than normal or higher than average, I should say. Um, that includes uh, our rates of HIV, um, syphilis, uh, especially congenital syphilis when um, the baby is actually born with syphilis. So in those cases, we are actually higher than um, the national averages of the people being diagnosed. Um, so, you know, when we look at things like more widespread notification, um, that means that we're going to be having more testing and more treatment. And again, hopefully, our strategy is less transmission happening in the community. So, um, so yeah, we're we're looking to kind of decrease those numbers um, through the digital partner services program. You touched on a couple of really important things there. The first is congenital syphilis. That has just really the, the, the rates of that have just exploded. And I know that among federal health officials, CDC, that is like one of their top priorities. Um, and the other thing is that you, you mentioned, even though the, the STIs that, that you're seeing there have been they've trended down over the last few years and it, with things like congenital syphilis and with certain populations, certain vulnerable groups, you don't necessarily see, see quite such dramatic declines if you see any at all. And that mirrors what we see nationally. So it's, you know, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because also nationally, you've said, the last uh, data set from CDC, STIs were generally down, but among certain groups that are very vulnerable and that have been been underserved, that's not necessarily the case. So, you know, it's good news as far as it goes, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And I, it's it, it doesn't surprise me that you're completely on top of that. Um, so that sort of segues to the next question, which is maybe restating some of what you just talked about. But I really want just in your words, very specifically, why are testing and treatment for STIs so important, so important? from the standpoint of a public health agency like yours? Yeah, so the more people can be aware of when they've been exposed to an STI, um, the more likely they will be to take steps to get tested. And again, the more we can prevent further transmission. You know, uh, unfortunately, people who have STIs don't always know that they have STIs. You know, um, the symptoms don't always present and so the, the notification part of um, partners and when you know we have clients who test positive, um, it's just such a crucial aspect um, and making sure that we follow up with those folks who may have been exposed. Um, it just helps connect those dots that may have not been connected otherwise because they may be asymptomatic. Um, and you know, again, another another aspect of this is, the importance of it is, um, you know, some folks aren't aware that syphilis and HIV can actually cause really severe disease if it's left untreated. Um, you know, especially people may be more aware of HIV, but that's the case with syphilis as well. You mm -hmm. know, even fewer people understand that um, leaving uh, things like chlamydia, gonorrhea untreated can also have very long-term consequences. Um, women who don't get treated can uh, end up getting pelvic inflammatory disease, which is very painful and has consequences that could um, impact future pre pregnancies. And, you know, there are also issues, um, reproductive issues with men as well. So, 
you know, right. these, these things if left untreated and if you don't have symptoms and they're untreated, um, they can have lifelong and serious consequences. So making sure that folks are notifying each other when testing does present a case of an STI, um, it's just crucial to maintaining the health of our community um, and just, you know, understanding those you know, potential future consequences is all part of that as well. I'm glad you touched on the aspect of STIs very commonly not showing obvious signs or symptoms. That is actually quite routine that they don't show obvious signs or symptoms. And if they do, they can you know sometimes mimic and be confused with other other conditions. So it may not even be clear that it's an STI. And 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 here too, you touched on syphilis. You know, I've heard um, some public health experts refer to syphilis as like the great imposter because even when there are symptoms, say initially they'll go away even without treatment. A person say, oh, well, maybe the, you know, that was no big deal. But yet, as you alluded to, the infection is still there and it can still do damage it's even years down, down the road. So uh, yeah, thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for touching on that. Uh, they're just, they're very frequently aren't obvious signs and symptoms. That's why testing and treatment, I think is so important. And I think you think that too. So there you go. All right. So my last question is, you know, sometimes people, even when they know or, or believe that they need these services, they're reluctant to pursue them because this can be a tough thing to do. There's a, so much needless shame and stigma around anything related to SEX. And of course, with STIs, that's that's uh, absolutely the case. So what would you say to somebody who would really like to take advantage of what your health department offers or offers, offers uh, or in another clinic? but they're just a little hesitant or they're worried that they might be judged, what would you like to say to them? Yeah, so we have um, no pressure conversations um, that are free of judgment. And the goal is to help you make informed decisions about your own health. Um, our services, you know, we aim to have this be the case across all of our um, services at public health, but particularly in our sexual health clinics, our services are, we describe as being inclusive and stigma free. Um, we welcome people of all ages, gender identities, gender expressions, um, sexual orientations. You know, the goal is just to make it an open, comfortable, judgment free space where you're able to learn about your health and make informed decisions about your health. Um, so, you know, we offer we offer a lot of services too that um, are available to folks who may not have a health insurance. So if that's a limiting factor as well, um, you know, we we just want folks to to come in and ask the questions, and you know, we're there to provide answers in a judgment free space. So um, yeah, absolutely, I would encourage anyone who is is kind of on the on the edge of wanting to come and have have that conversation, um, just know that we will be there to listen and and hopefully help you provide provide that care. Well said. I'm very jealous of your eloquence on these topics. Thank you for that. We've been talking with Morgan Finke, the communications coordinator with Public Health Madison in Dane County in Wisconsin. Uh, Morgan, thank you for your time. I and mean, we, we always like to stay on top of novel approaches, especially anything around apps and digital platforms. So your insights are much appreciated. Thank you again. Thank you. And if it's okay, I'll put a link to your health department in the show notes. So listeners, please check out their website. Just, just click below wherever you found this. And thank you, intrepid listeners, for joining us as always. Keep in touch. We're at info at ashasexualhealth.org. Send along your comments. If you got any topics you'd like us to cover on the podcast, let us know and we will see you next time.